welcome everybody to uh, our Thursday evening program here but not here at the Rockland Public Library. My name is Jesse Blanchard and I am one of the librarians here, the one that gets to stay alone in the building at night. Um, before we get started, just so you know, we are doing all of our programming right now uh, via Zoom. Um, they're still at 6.30 and they're still on uh, Thursday evenings. So that being said, next Thursday's talk is going to be um, readings from the Rockland Shakespeare Society. They're gonna be reading some of their favorite scenes from their favorite plays, including Henry V, uh, Midsummer Night's Dream, Much Ado About Nothing, Othello and Romeo and Juliet. Um, that should be pretty interesting. And just so you know, I have a little, a little fun fact about the Rockland Shakespeare Society. Um, they've been meeting in the library or a version of the library since 1889. Um, and they started out as a group of women looking for intellectual stimulation and did not admit men until the late 1980s. Uh, <laughs> and when they could still meet in the building, they were meeting here twice a week for over a hundred years. Yeah. Uh, so if you want to get the link for that uh, Zoom program, email Patty King. She's the deputy director. Her email address is pking, P-K-I-N-G, at rocklandmaine.gov. That's R-O-C-K-L-A-N-D-M-A-I-N-E dot G-O-V. Uh, now we're going to turn it over to uh, UMaine Professor uh, Sarah, Sarah Harlan Hoy, who's going to be telling us some cool stuff about medieval rhymes of Robin Hood. Uh, as I said before, if the um, participation seems small like this, feel free to unmute yourself if you have a question. If it starts to amp up, then I will um, say something in the chat and we can save the questions until the end, or I will present them. All right, I take it away, Sarah. Okay, thanks everyone for coming. This is really exciting for me. I wish I were actually physically in Rockland because I love the town, but I'm coming to you from Bangor and I see some familiar faces here and some not so familiar, but I appreciate your coming in for my talk on late medieval rhymes of Robin Hood. Um, I wanna thank the Rockland Public Library, Patty King and Jessica Blanchard for organizing this event. I'm here on behalf of the um, McGillicuddy Humanities Center as part of their Speakers Bureau, which is an outreach uh, program at the University of Maine that advocates for education in the humanities and the arts. So we try to show up around the state and give presentations that make people think hard about literature and uh, history, art, music, things like that, <laughs> and show you what we can do with that material. So. I'm gonna talk uh, from my specialty as a medievalist, but I hope that the issues that I raise here have some relevance to your lives and make you think a little bit about some of the bigger themes that I'm going to introduce today. So just give me a second. I'm gonna uh, switch my screen over. I'm gonna share my slides with you. So if you do have something you wanna ask, I won't really be able to keep an eye on the chat. I know Jessica offered to do some of that for me. But you're welcome also to shout out if you feel like it a question and interrupt me at any time because I can I can do I can deal with that, I think. So here we go. I'm sharing my screen with you. Okay. So let me just make sure that this works. Yeah. Yay. Okay, here we are. <laughs> All right, so one big question that's sort of floated above, I guess, civilization since the very beginning probably is the question, is fiction good for us? Um, we navigate seas of fiction every day. We consume it in forms of, you know, in TV, in, uh, sound like podcasts, radio, we read. Um, in fact, our world is just, it really is just a sea of fiction in a way. We're always consuming stories. And some stories are more dominant than other stories. I mean, if you think about right now and the amount of, I guess, I call it superhero stories, right? Our, our children, our pop culture is just suffused with stories about superheroes. 
and everyone goes and sees the new Marvel movie. <laughs> and it, it becomes a sort of layer of almost like a virtual reality that floats over our everyday life. You know, we find ourselves asking ourselves, you know, what would Batman do in this situation? <laughs> and so, you know, once in a while you run into a debate about, um, you know, is it good for us to consume so much fantasy, for example? Is it bad for our brains? Do we, do we lose track of uh, reality? Do we live in a, in a place that's not really the real world? Are we stunted in some way emotionally when we consume too much fiction? And you know, most people would say, no, fiction teaches us empathy and makes us better people. And I would agree with that. But it is interesting to look at moments in time where an incredibly dominant story type just was on everybody's minds and changed the way they interacted with their daily lives. And I think this is the case of late medieval Robin Hood poems. Um, so I'm going to show you some of the ways in which I think there is this kind of um, powerful influence that these stories about Robin Hood exerted on everyday people's lives and made them live their lives differently, almost as if they were play acting or inhabiting the persona of Robin Hood and his merry men from time to time. So uh, that's going to be what we're going to talk about today. And I'll introduce you to the genre. And I will be reading uh, some Middle English, which is you know, the older form of English that we still speak today. And I have included the poems that I'll be reading from on the slides. So um, I'll try to read it slowly and I'll try to translate words that might not be familiar to you. But we will be digging into the poetry a little bit today. So let's see, I think my slides are just kind of wiggling around a little bit. Um, so the English outlaw tradition is a really long one. Um, aside from the story of King Arthur, which is the other great myth that came from the British Isles that we all know, the other big story uh, that is, I guess, part of the legacy of the medieval period in Great Britain is the story of the outlaw. Uh, Robin Hood and Little John, Maid Marian, Friar Tuck, those are the most famous characters in this, this outlaw tradition. We're probably familiar with them from movies and stories. But before there were Robin Hood poems, there were poems about other outlaws who were equally fascinating and who also engaged with natural spaces in interesting ways, uh, challenged authority figures, lived in exile, um, inhabited various landscapes, killed the deer. <laughs> um, and it was a really popular narrative tradition in the British Isles, even more so than the rest of Western Europe. Uh, for some reason, people who lived in Great Britain in particular just love to tell stories about outlaws. Um, I think maybe one of the reasons for this is this is an island nation that saw itself as in some ways separate from continental Europe and had kind of an outsider's mentality already. And that possibly is one of the reasons why outlaw narratives were so popular in the Middle Ages. But you might also have theories about what that might be. So I'll just let you kind of think about that question as I keep talking. Um, so my first, this, this project that I'm working on right now is really looking at the ways in which late medieval people, that is people in the 14th and 15th century in England, were living their lives in a way that reflected the fiction that they consumed, that is outlaw poems. So I'm gonna just show you some examples of what I'm talking about here. Um, and they're kind of diverse. So I'll try to give you some context for each example and then show you why I think um, this is happening. So the first is a really fascinating mingling of fact, of fact and fiction from a, a famous family that kept really good records of their household, the Pastons. Um, so John Paston II is writing to his son, John Paston III, because his family servant has disappeared from the estate. A certain William Wood, a horse keeper, has left the Paston service. He's just disappeared. He's been working for them for a while, taking care of their horses, and now he's nowhere to be found. Paston mourns his loss because heck hepped him this reyer to play St. George and Robin Hood on the Sheriff of Nottingham. So Paston's not upset, really, that his horseman is gone, like, walk about that he's disappeared. What he's excited, what he's sad about is that his horse keeper has bailed and now he has nobody who can perform the characters of St. George, the patron saint of England, Robin Hood and the Sheriff of Nottingham. So that tells us something about 
what this family values, right? They value the performance of these fictional stories. Um, and so this guy's just as weird, where is he gone? Um, supposedly, according to John Paston II, he has gone into Bernesdale. So Bernesdale is like, um, in the early Robin Hood poems, instead of Sherwood Forest, the outlaws inhabit the forest of Barnesdale. So here we see John Passon thinking about his real life servant actually becoming an outlaw, becoming a version of the outlaw that he performs <laughs> and living in the woods instead of working for him. So it's this interesting mingling of, of the fictional world of the outlaws and the real world of this household. Are there any questions on that? Does that make sense? Okay. Here's another interesting one. This is, a, this is another story that has to be sort of set up. Um, let's see, in the 15th century, there were a lot of uh, what we might call now um, gangs running all over the country <laughs> and causing problems, you know, and maybe something more like a mafia, slightly somewhat organized crime with a uh, head of the crime syndicate who is often referred to as like a king or a chief, or uh, usually actually king is the typical term. And they would do things like extort money from people, blackmail, um, blackmail households, uh, steal um, servants, get in fights. <laughs> um, so we have a, an interesting letter that's written by one of these kings of uh, these proto-mafia groups. It's written in French and it's emulating two different genres. The first is the genre of the king's letter sent to his subject. The second genre is the outlaw threat sent to an opponent. So I'll read a little bit of the middle, the old French, and then I'll switch to the modern English translation. Uh, Lionel, roi de la route de Ravenneuse, a nostre foes et disloyeuse Richard de Snow's Hill, salute sans amours. Nous vous mandons sur peine de con que vous pouvez fort faire contre nous et nos élèves que vous, etc. And this is saying, oh, wow, my screen just died. Justin, yeah. my screen just went black. <laughs> Sorry, everybody. Oh, here it comes back. I can still see it. I can still <laughs> see it, but I can't. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Lionel, king of the root of raveners, salutes, but with little love, his false and disloyal Richard of Snozzle. We command you on pain to lose all that can stand forfeit against our laws, that you immediately remove from his office him whom you maintain in the vicarage of Burton Agnes, and that you suffer that the abbot of St. Mary's have his rights in this matter. And if you will not pay attention to our commandments, that is the commandments of this mafia group, we will send out our Viscount of the North, who will bring upon you the grand destruction aforementioned, given from our castle of the North Wind in the Green Tower in the first year of our reign. So this is a really interesting letter <laughs> because we, here we have a criminal uh, ventriloquizing a king, but a specific kind of king, right? An outlaw king uh, writing his letter from his castle of the North Wind in the Green Tower, right? This is an outlaw domain that he's writing from. Any questions about that? So here we see real life criminals pretending to be fictional criminals. Okay, here's another cool example of this um, collision of reality and fiction. Um, uh, for a certain moment in, in the 1300s, I think it was 1357, um, Edward III, the King of England at the time, uh, took the King of France, that is Jean II, captive and held him hostage in England. So he was actually a, a captive of the English um, king for I think a year or so. So we have the French king living as a hostage in the English court. At one point, um, Edward devises a mock ambush of King John of France. So King John is moving across um, England on a big uh, road, like a, a way that's used by a lot of people. And he's got a, an entourage of a bunch of knights guarding him, bodyguards, and his own servants. And they're all just riding along. And as they enter into a woodland, all of a sudden, uh, a bunch of men dressed in green jump out from behind the trees <laughs> and uh, take 
Prince John II hostage. And um, so we don't really get the reaction from the chronicler about how uh, King John felt about this, this being taken hostage, but it becomes pretty clear quickly along that all these people dressed in green, I think it was something like 120 men, all dressed in the uniform of foresters, which is green, were all dressed by the king, Edward III, and that they were placed there as a kind of pageant or a play show of, a, of an abduction or a, an ambush, right? So they're pretending to be outlaws, but they're actually the king's men and they're performing uh, let's see, a pseudo abduction in the style of Robin Hood and his married men of the real French king who is actually a hostage of the English court. Does that make sense? So it's just like this huge hall of mirrors where, you know, there is an actual prisoner here, which is the king of France, but there's the performance of the taking prisoner of this man once more, one more time. And it's a way for King Edward to show his power, to perform this kind of um, playful, um, hostility that's characteristic of the outlaw stories um, and also just show off his wealth you know in the fact that he's getting he's making costumes for all these men <laughs> and putting them on them really just for this one performance so I find that to be a particularly interesting interesting incident any questions about that one okay um, Robin Hood is on the minds of people, not just kings, not just criminals, not just owners of households like John Paston, but um, it seems like people from almost every walk of life. So here I've got three different examples of this um, evidence that Robin Hood was on people's minds at all sorts of times and in all sorts of places. On your left, you'll see the schoolboy exercise, and this is a really famous a uh, little poem that appears in what appear what seems to be a child's uh, primer. So a little schoolboy who's going to school and learning how to read Latin and, you know, to memorize, you know, bits of Virgil and things like that. He's copying his exercises in his little notebook and his mind wanders. And in the margins of this manuscript, you can see the image down here at the bottom. It's a, a little bit of the facsimile of the manuscript. He's just writing down a poem that he's thinking about. He's daydreaming about Robin Hood. And here's his little poem. Robin Hood and Sherwood stood, hooded and hatted, hosed and shoulded, four and twenty arrows he bar in his hondas. So Robin stood in Sherwood. He's got his hood on, his hat, his hose, and his shoes. He's bearing four and thirty arrows. And that, that's the little rhyme. We don't have the poem that this comes from. But it seems pretty clear that the little boy who's writing this down is thinking of the rhyme of Robin Hood, maybe a, a song going with it. And his, his hand is just wandering and he's writing you know, this little poem down while he thinks about his hero instead of paying attention to his homework. <laughs> so daydreaming has always been a thing for children and, and adults. And we see this charming evidence of that here. So in the schoolroom, children are thinking about Robin Hood. Just like now, students think about, I don't know, the Avengers or Batman or whatever. Here we have on the top right, the courtroom drama example. Um, here we have a lawyer actually bringing up Robin Hood in a case. Uh, he says that his opponent, the other lawyer, um, is just speaking just so much nonsense. He just, everything that's coming out of this other lawyer's mouth is just, is just silliness. Uh, he might as well be saying, Robin Hood in Bernersdale stood. And so that's an interesting one because first of all, people are thinking about Robin Hood in the courtroom, um, but also here you can see that for this lawyer, this kind of rhyme, the rhyme of Robin Hood is a signifier for nonsense, a kind of um, worthless pop culture that's meaningless and ephemeral, right? Seems like that's what he's arguing here. Uh, and that becomes even clearer in this, this final little example, the nonsense poem. It's a little nonsense poem that appears in another kind of complica complicated manuscript tradition. But here we see Robin Hood appear almost as like a little miniature fairy type creature. I'll read it to you. Robin Hood in Barnesdal stood, he landed him tell a maple thistle. Then come our laddie and sweet Saint Andrew, slept thou, walks thou, Geoffrey Cook. So there, it's, it actually is a nonsense poem, right? Robin Hood is standing in Barnsdale. That's his usual habitat, if it's not Sherwood Forest. 
He's leaning himself against a maple thistle, which is not a thing. And, <laughs> and then we have, you know, what seems to be the Virgin Mary and St. Andrew, and then this, you know, aside to somebody named uh, Jeffrey Cook. And so this kind of doggerel rhyme sounds like it's just, um, it's almost like the invocation of, invocation of Robin Hood here is also signaling a kind of playful nonsense, if that makes sense. Hope it does. Any questions? Should I back up on anything or are we clear on most everything? I, I got a question for you, Sarah. So, so all of these little examples are things that kind of just floated around that people would have known or have overheard somewhere? Right. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, right, so this, this textual evidence is actually pretty slim, right? They've only got five little snippets of poetry that seem to be connected to the Robin Hood material. In the late medieval period, we only have um, five surviving poems that are about Robin Hood and his merry men, uh, which isn't that many. But for the medieval period, it's actually quite a few because because this is a popular tradition, it's not likely to be written down anyway, right? It's not something that's, it's not about saints, it's not about great, you know, heroes like Arthur. And so it's less likely to be written down by somebody who knows how to write and read. So the fact that they're written at all is pretty significant. And then we have a lot of evidence, yeah, from this, this sort of stuff that just suggests that everybody's familiar with this material. Huh. Um, we also have a lot of household accounts and parish accounts um, that tell us that um, seasonal games like May games and June games in particular, sometimes around Christmas, often involved a kind of performance of um, Robin Hood stories. And that usually somebody like that horse keeper, you know, would be appointed as the Robin Hood and they would perform favorite stories from the tradition and travel around the parish sometimes. And they would actually abduct people, you know, in a playful way. And they'd be held hostage by the outlaws who would be dressed in green or something like that until they paid up a little bit of money, which then would go towards the church, for example, or the local hall where everybody would hang out. And so it would be a kind of a fun uh, fundraising event. So we don't really have any surviving texts from that tradition except for one fragment of a play that seemed to have been performed on, in such an a situation, but we do have a lot of accounts, you know, to say we paid uh, John M the Miller, you know, five casks of ale to be the Robin Hood this year, you know, so the account tells us that it was happening and all over England, if that makes sense. Yeah, cool, right. thank you. Yeah, here's a really cool one that I'm really fascinated with right now. Um, so outlawry was a real thing as well as a fictional thing. If you uh, broke the law and failed to appear at the court at the appointed day and nobody knew where you were, then you would be labeled an outlaw or a wolf's head. And anybody that could catch you, you know, would then get a reward, you know, kind of like the Wild West <laughs> for bringing you in. If you were nefarious enough, you could be, you know, the kind of dead, dead and alive outlaw that we also would recognize from Westerns. Um, so people would find themselves on the wrong side of the law, but they could depend on a few things. One, if they could make it to a place that was remote enough that might have other people who are living, you know, outside of their homes, um, they might be able to, you know, join a band that looks something like Robin Hood is Merry Men, or they could go to a church where they could demand sanctuary, uh, from the church. And I think you could stay within the bounds of a church for 40 days, after which point your sanctuary has fallen and you can be you know, taken by the authorities. Uh, but there were a few places in England where not just the church, but the entire um, city area around the church was a designated sanctuary area. And one of these few places was this town uh, called Beverly in York. And this town, Beverly, is really interesting to me because not only was it a sanctuary town, but it was also famous for its minstrel population. So this is the famous church that you see in these images. It's called St. Mary's. And the Minstrels Guild 
uh, which is just a, you know, all the different performers, the singers, the jugglers, the, um, the poets, the dancers, all the people that would perform uh, stories like Robin Hood or the, the stories about the Knights of the Round Table or other romances, or other saints' lives. Um, these are the people who are responsible for maintaining the cultural tradition and going around from household to household with stories for sale, basically. Uh, by the end of the Middle Ages, they had formed uh, pretty seriously organized guilds, which would protect the members um, from violence, um, would have some sort of mechanisms in place for, you know, getting back at people who didn't pay, right? <laughs> if you show up at somebody's house and they don't pay you for your song, well, then you can call in your friends and you all show up and say, listen, you know, Lord, so-and-so, you got to pay us for what we did here, you know? Um, so by the end of the Middle Ages, it was a pretty organized group and they had a particularly strong uh, presence in this town, Beverly. And they were, they had a really wealthy guild that actually, its power stretched all over the north of England. Um, I lost my screen again. Um, you guys can still see it? Yeah, I can see it. Okay, great. Uh, okay, I can't see it. Justin, do you wanna come over here for a second? <laughs> Keep calling my husband because it's his system. Uh, anyway, I was talking about the minstrels. Oh, right, so the guilds, um, in order to sort of celebrate their ascendancy and power, paid for all this decoration on this really famous, really beautiful church, St. Mary's. And so if you look at these images here on the left, you have different performers. I think they would have had um, their instruments in their hands, but the instruments have fallen off um, through the ages, drums, tambours, lutes, things like that. And they're standing all around the top of the church. And here on the right, you can see a carving of a minstrel playing uh, the bagpipes. Um, so, these minstrels were a really big presence in this town of Beverly, and so were the outlaws that took uh, refuge there. So there's this interesting correspondence between the minstrels, who were the disseminators of this fictional outlaw narrative all over England, and the real life outlaws that inhabited the, the sanctuary of this town, Beverly. Um, to add to that complicated, you know, mingling of, of reality and fiction, um, I would add that, um, non-guild minstrel members were often seen as somehow like outlaws themselves. They were often living on the margins of society. They were seen as sort of dangerous elements. <laughs> so it, you could slip pretty quickly from, you know, being a guild approved minstrel to, you know, more like an outlaw. And um, what I find fascinating is not only does this church preserve these carvings of these musicians plying their trade, but it also preserves um, carvings of what appear to be bits of story that minstrels would have told, like bits of story that people would have recognized. So here's some images that scream Greenwood to me, Greenwood being the, the habitat of the outlaws. On the left, you've got a tree and two deer, you know, the, the classic prey of the outlaws. On the right, you have um, some other more supernatural denizens of the forest uh, in the middle, the wood woes is who are sort of wild men who sometimes um, sometimes they get fur all over their body. It's almost like they're little yetis, you know, um, or Bigfoots or something like that. <laughs> but they also, you know, sometimes the outlaws are portrayed as green men themselves. And so there is a kind of slippage between human outlaws and the other kinds of scary green clad beings that you might run into in the woods. Uh, another carving that I find particularly interesting in this church is the so-called Robin Hood Misericord. Um, and here you can see, it's hard to recognize the iconography if you're not used to the period, but on the left, um, this is a king or a monarch, probably a monarch or really highly rank, ranking lord here. And he's out hunting in the woods. Um, and he's got his bow, he's got his arrows back there. And then on the other side of the tree, is what we think is probably an outlaw, probably Robin Hood. Um, so you might have recognized, I mean, if you've watched any Robin Hood movies, you might remember the, the plot point where the king um, 
some, usually it's King Richard in the movie tradition, finds out that the outlaws have been doing all this stuff and he goes to the Greenwood in disguise and then they abduct him and then, you know, he, he fights Robin Hood and in the end they discover that they're both, you know, good gentlemen and they, they forgive each other. <laughs> so that seems like this particular carving is depicting that particular part of that story. So I just find this really fascinating that these real life minstrels who plied the story, the fictional stories of Robin Hood that also were part of this town that was really just kind of a, a sanctuary for outlaws, real outlaws would then put in their church all these images that suggest outlaw narratives. Any questions about that? Um, the question of sanctuary does show up in the early Robin Hood material. Um, bad guys often violate the you know really important law of sanctuary. So this is one of the early poems, Robin Hood and the Monk. And here, um, I'll just read it to you. And then we can talk about what we see. Um, okay. When Robin come to Nottingham, certainly without line, without lying, I'm telling you, he prayed to God and mealed Mary to bring him out save again. He's praying that God brings him out of Nottingham safely. He goes into St. Mary Church and can nail it down before the road. He kneels down before the cross. All that ever were in the church within beheld well Robin Hood. So everyone who's in the church sees Robin Hood praying. Beside him stood a great hooded monk. He prayed to God, woe he be. For soon he can good Robin, as soon as he him say. So the monk sees Robin Hood. What does he do? Out at the door he ran, for soon and anon. All the gats of Nottingham he's mad to be spotted every chon. So the monk runs out of the door of the church and has all the gates of Nottingham closed so that he so that Robin Hood can't get out of the city walls. Rise up, he said, the prude sheriff, busk thee and mak thee boon. Ye have speared the king is felon, for soth he is in this tune. Ye have speared the false felon as he stoned is at his massa. It is long of they, said the monk, and ever he fro was passa. This traitor nam is Robin Hood under the grainwood lind. He robbed me once of a hundred pound. He never shall owe to me mean. So he says, get up, sheriff, come help me. I found the king's felon. He's in the town. Um, he's standing at mass. Um, and I don't want him to escape because one time he stole a hundred pounds of mine and I can't forget it. Up then rose the proud sheriff and rodly mad him yar. Many was the motor son to the kirk with him can far. In at the door as they throw thee fast, with stav as full good won. Alas, alas, said Robin Hood, now Missy Little John. <laughs> so there comes the sheriff with all his men, they're bearing their staves, and Robin Hood's caught basically um, with no defense because he's been praying in church. And so it seems like this moment here, um, it clearly makes the monk seem nefarious, right? Because he's He's broken the law of sanctuary. He's betrayed somebody who's come to church to pray. Robin Hood isn't even, isn't even asking for sanctuary, right? He's just, he just needs to be a good Christian. <laughs> um, but it suggests that, you know, these, these questions of sanctuary are important to the writers of this poem. And I think it's an interesting thing to set next to those, um, you know, these images from the actual church that was a sanctuary for outlaws. Okay, um, I'm getting to the end of the first half of the talk, uh, and we have been talking for 30 minutes. Um, I'm going to try to maybe shorten it because I do not want to talk more than 45 minutes total. Because um, I just know how painful that can be. So any questions for me now, before we move on? If you if anybody doesn't want to unmute themselves, you can feel free to type something in the chat and I can uh, I can ask Sarah for you. Okay. I think we can probably keep going. Thank you. All right. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about a chapter that I'm working on that deals with, um, on the one hand, the performance of poaching in outlaw texts in the fictional world of Robin Hood. And on the other hand, uh, real poachers practices in the woods of England in, at the same time. And I'm going to try to show you how um, real poachers who are hunting the king's deer and other um, animals in the woods and preserves 
were thinking about Robin Hood and the stories of Robin Hood when they did it. And they would sometimes poach in a style that suggested that they were imitating uh, the behaviors of these fictional outlaws. So um, let's skip this. Um, so I'm going to be comparing late medieval outlaw fictions with real poaching performances in the 14th, 15th century. And then I'm also going to bring this around, hopefully, to talk a little bit about how this legacy of performative poaching is still with us today in the Anglo-American world. And so it's an interesting thing to think about. OK. Um, a lot of scholars have argued that the Robin Hood material and the outlaw material is um, it represents to a certain extent a rural identity that feels like it's under attack. Um, after the Norman conquest in 1066, basically every English king that came afterwards continued to take more land into his own um, ownership and make it harder for people to access the land that they'd been used to using over generations. And so, for example, if you were used to hunting um, you know, birds, in a woodland, all of a sudden that's the king's wood and you're not allowed to use it anymore. If you're used to gathering firewood, you know, at a certain, for your fires over the winter or cutting down trees, all of a sudden that forest is the king's forest and you're not allowed to take any wood from it unless the woods, unless the branch has fallen. You're, you can collect, you know, things that have fallen, but you're not allowed to actually harm any trees. And so what some critics would argue, and I think is probably true, you know, a lot of this outlaw material is kind of a protest literature that's saying like, back in my grandfather's 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 day, we used to be able to just hunt deer when we wanted to. And we used to be able to, you know, take down a tree if we wanted to. But now, um, let's see, here's our quote that I have listed here, right? In times past, uh, the area was, um, was fruitfully planted with churches and with people who worshiped the Lord, but now, um, men are expelled, homes are cast down, the land is made habitable only for wild beasts. So, you know, forests are being produced and, and wildernesses and, and wild spaces are being made. And, um, but in the process, like villages that have been there since time immemorial have been just sort of pushed out. So um, that's a really interesting thing too. Um, so it's a notion of like, okay, I used to have a land here, now I don't. I used to have a home here, now I don't. I used to hunt for deer here, now I don't. So this is sort of narrative of loss, if that makes sense. Um, so I've been looking at some modern um, studies of poachers, like from the 20th and 21st century, and a lot of the rhetoric um, about, you know, what my grandfather's grandfather did is also part of modern poachers, uh, you know, justifications for what, why they take animals. So I'm going to read this one. Um, this is from some uh, Acadian, po Cajun poachers down in Louisiana. I outlaw because nobody's going to tell me what to hunt, where to hunt, or when to hunt. My daddy hunted like that and his daddy before him. Well, I tell you, any species that comes with range of my shotgun that I think is good to eat is a real endangered species. <laughs> so here we have these, you know, real life poachers saying like, I take down animals and I poach partly for the meat, but really partly just to make a political statement. And that's true here of the Robin Hood uh, characters too. So for example, in this, um, really famous line from the Little Jest of Robin Hood, a really famous late medieval Robin, Robin Hood poem. Little John tells the, um, the outlaws, look that you cape well our trystle tray under the lave is small and spare none of the venison that goes in this vault. So he's saying, uh, keep our tree, you know, make sure we always meet at the same tree, but also spare none of the venison that goes in this veil. It's not like take a few deer here and there. It's like, if you see a deer, kill it. <laughs> Okay, so um, let's see here. There's some more like this, you know, Robin, this one here, always went good Robin, be hawk and be hill. He went by, uh, by, by forest and by hill, and he always slew the king's deer and wilt them as well, and he had power over them. So whenever Robin sees a king's deer, he kills it. Um, just going to skip forward here, try to find some other examples. Um, trying to shorten this on my feet here. Um, hmm. Okay, here's a good example. <laughs> um, here's some po real life poachers from the 1300s. Um, two men kill a deer in 1311. 
and they enlist the aid of two others, including a lad employed by the victor of Scaly to carry to the vicarage without the vicar's knowledge. There they skin it with the help of Dionysia, the vicar's maid, who is given a share of the venison. She then gives some to Emma, a local laundress, and sends the rest out to the vicar's plowman in the fields for their dinner. So here we have a, an act of poaching that results in this sort of magnificent sharing of the meat among a bunch of people who probably really appreciate it. And it results in a kind of, I, I guess, an impromptu feast, which is also pretty typical of um, the outlaw material. Um, when the outlaws kill a deer, if they don't just leave it on the ground, which they do sometimes, they'll produce this magnificent feast um, that's you know, equivalent to the feasts of you know, noblemen. I'm just trying to find one here for you guys. Um, sorry for this moving around. I know I have some stuff on feasts. Okay, here we go. Here they've captured a knight, and this is in one of the Robin Hood poems. Um, and the knight is feasting within the greenwood, and here we have bread and wine enough, and nobles of the deer, swans and pheas pheasants, and fowls of the river. Uh, there failed never so little a bird that ever was bred on brer. So like, not only are they being fed deer, but also swans, pheasants, fowls, and every little bird that's ever, <laughs> ever sat on a twig in this wood has been killed you know, by the outlaws in order to produce this, this impromptu feast for the night. And the knight responds, Gramercy, sir, had said he, such a dinner had he not of all these wake as three. So the knight's kind of like nervous about being captured by the outlaws and he's being very polite here, you know, thanks for a really great dinner. But also there's a certain kind of menace, you know, behind his lines, because what else is he going to say? Um, so there's a certain pleasure in sticking it to the man now, then, in the fiction, in real life. Here's a modern person saying, if it were not for the game wardens, I would not outlaw, that is poach. They make it fun. I got pictures of boatloads of ducks, three deer in a night, and alligators. Um, that's true um, of that kind of, like, that, that's a, I guess that's an equivalent to what I was just reading from this, um, you know, this feast, where, you know, the pleasure is coming partly from killing all these animals, but actually mostly from sticking it to the authorities who might come around and, and give you crap, if that makes sense. Okay, um, this kind of um, somewhat menacing um, performance of, of violence or poaching against animals um, can get actually pretty scary. So here's a real court case. I'm not gonna read the whole thing. Um, but this, this is um, some poachers who are apprehended. Um, if you look towards the middle of the page, um, the, all these different guys were caught. They entered the aforesaid forest on Wednesday during the feast of St. Bartholomew in the 56th year with bows and arrows. And they were shooting in the same forest the whole of the day and they killed three deer without warrant. Then they cut off the head of a buck and they put it on a stake in the middle of a certain clearing, which is called harlerooting, placing in the mouth of the aforesaid head a certain spindle. And they made the mouth gape towards the sun in great contempt of the Lord King and his foresters. Um, so here we have you know, some poachers entering a forest, killing some deer, taking away the meat. That's not all. They're taking the head off of a buck and sticking it on a pike, basically, so that the head sort of gapes open. And when the foresters come up, they're going to see this really scornful, really macabre um, deer's head on a stick. <laughs> it seems to be you know, a calculated insult. And if we look at... Um, Here's another example of a similar practice in real life in the 14th century. These guys um, into the forest with dogs and arrows and killed, let's see, hmm, like 18 stags and hinds within the forest and in despite had cut off their heads and set them up on the stake. So this is another instance where the deer's head had been set up on stakes, stakes as a kind of um, thumbing of the nose to the man, if that makes sense. Um, if you look at the Robin Hood poems, you also see this notion of putting something's head on a stick to make a point. Um, in this case, in the Robin Hood poem of uh, Sir Rob Robin Hood and Guy of Gisborne, the head that's stuck on the stake is not a deer's, but a human's. Um, Sir Guy of Gisborne is a bounty hunter, outlaw hunter, and he confronts Robin Hood in the woods and they have a duel and Robin Hood wins and he takes Sir Guy's head off of his body and sticks his head on top of the stick and then he nicks it with an Irish knife so that it can't be recognized. It's a very gruesome scene, but it suggests that 
you know, either the outlaw poems are riffing on the actual practice of insulting foresters by sticking deer's heads on, on sticks or the other way around, right? The real life poachers are thinking of poems like this when they perform these acts of protest in the woods. Okay. I mean, what does this tell us about late medieval life? Um, a lot of things. I think it, um, it shows us how stories then as now become a common currency and they function as a way to express, you know, different attitudes and um, concerns and kind of shorthand, right? Uh, if you invoke a well-known story like Robin Hood under a certain circumstance, um, you don't have to really verbalize, you know, all the things you're trying to say, you know, you're just like, listen, it's just like when Robin Hood did this thing, you know, it becomes a, it becomes a mode of communicating beyond just the verbal. Um, it's interesting to think about, you know, how these incredibly violent stories of <laughs> outlaws, you know, were so important to people at all sorts of levels of society, right? We have a king having his men dressed up as outlaws and waylaying another king on the one hand, and then we have real life mafiosi, you know, pretending to be outlaws too. All these different social classes and castes are all using this material in different ways uh, to serve different needs. Um, but not everybody approved of the use of Robin Hood stories and the constant obsession with and performance of them. Uh, we have two examples of late medieval people, moralists who were concerned with how popular these stories were. And then I'm, this is the last thing I'm going to share with you, and then we're going to open up for questions. Um, in Pierce Plowman, which is a, it's a poem that's contemporaneous with Chaucer's Canterbury Tales, um, a, an allegorical figure named Sloth. So it's a, it's a figure that actually embodies laziness and ne'er-do-wellness, right? It's a character that is also the embodiment of the, of the, the vice of Sloth, is speaking about what he does and what he doesn't do in his daily life. And he says, he can not perfectly make pater noster as a priest it singeth, but he can ream as of Robin Hood and Randolph Earl of Chester. Ac neither of our Lord nor of our laddie the less that ever was mad. So this sloth character is saying, I don't know my, our father. I don't know the prayers. You know, I don't know the creed. I don't really know anything about religious matters. I, I have never memorized a single prayer, but I do know all the rhymes of Robin Hood. <laughs> and Randolph Earl of Chester. So, I mean, this is a fictional character. It's an allegorical character representing laziness. Um, all he ever does is hang out in bars and taverns and, you know, just get drunk and sleep with women. Um, but it, it does tell us something about, you know, the, mor the moral turpitude of these poems that this, this particular author sees in them. Um, yeah, so there's another one, but I'm not gonna read it because for the sake of time. So I uh, thank you all for your, um, your attention. I really do hope we can have a little bit of a conversation. I can also go back to any slides that you'd like me to clarify or talk about a little bit more. I'm gonna, um, for now, I'm gonna unshare my screen so that we can all maybe see each other a little better if I can figure out how to do that. So thanks. I'm just trying to do this. Share? Yeah, I don't know how to unshare. Yeah. <laughs> I think Thank I do. I'll have to find a little thingy. Yeah, there we go. Oh, there you are. Yeah. So it seems kind of cool, I guess, or is it even true that that the stories were popular among all all classes of people? Yeah. Or used for their purposes. Yeah. I mean, it used to be the theory was people when we first started studying these poems. The assumption was that they were functioning just for the lower classes, right? That they became, they were a wish fulfilling fantasy, you know, of, of resistance to power and, you know, caste and things like that. Um, I think that they do function in that way. They, I mean, definitely people of lower social classes did interact with this fiction on a, re a regular basis, but there's a lot of evidence that, you know, noblemen and kings also loved these stories, <laughs> you know, that it really was for everybody. And 
was performed in all sorts of places. So, I mean, we, we have, for example, records that, you know, certain minstrels, professional performers would go, you know, sometimes they go to church fairs and local villages and perform this stuff. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they go to households like the Pastons mm -hmm. and perform the same material. Sometimes they'd even go to, you know, courts, you know, with really fancy people like dukes and duchesses and also perform that material for the household, you know, so it would not just be the duke and duchess and her, their children, but also, you know, all the people who worked at the estate. Um, so it'd be a communal experience of song, dance, poetry, and a certain kind of um, probably performance, you know, like an actual performing of the lines mm -hmm. that everybody would have seen and thought about. Yeah. Does anybody else have any questions for Sarah? You may unmute yourself. <clears throat> One of your slides had the title Contemporary Backlash. Mm -hmm. I'm interested if you can elaborate on that. Was there like a social backlash on all this? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, there definitely was. I mean, the, the backlash that I was citing were, you know, contemporary moralists who saw the consumption of this kind of fiction is bad for people's brains, you know, making them either lazy and just, you know, wanting to hang out in the, in the taverns and things like that and hear these stories. But also there was a real concern that listening to these narratives of, you know, people who are um, reacting to this, the established social order encouraged a certain kind of rebelliousness in the population. So, um, for example, in 1381, there was a really important event for England, which is, used to be called the Peasants' Revolt. Now it's called the Uprising of 1381. Basically, it was this really incredible moment before social media, when all of a sudden, all over England, um, through some sort of um, communication system that we still don't really understand, it seems like maybe word of mouth, a bunch of different counties, a bunch of people in different counties just marched towards London. Um, saying like, um, we are being taxed too much. Um, we wanna to talk to the king about this. <laughs> we don't trust his uh, representatives and administrators. The bureaucracy has gotten to be too much. So basically they, they all marched towards England or marched towards London, which is the, you know, the capital and scared the crap out of people in power. Um, it really was a scary moment because it, it was a rebellion and it was armed. Um, and they killed a bunch of people in London. It was a, it was a real um, riot. Of course, a lot of the people they killed were foreigners. There was a real xenophobic element to this uh, uprising. And the, um, the, the rebels were not controlled. They, wouldn't, they could not be controlled until finally the king himself appeared on horseback and said, oh, I'll listen to your demands. I promise to uh, change the way things work here in England. Um, and then he basically sort of did the equivalent of shaking the hand of the leaders. And then of course the leaders were seized and beheaded. And that was the end of that particular <laughs> uprising. <laughs> um, but you know, some of the rebels, they went by pseudonyms and the pseudonyms are really interesting. It was like Reynold Greenleaf, Robin Hood, the Fairy Queen. So it was all these characters from this kind of um, genre of, of, of fiction that they, they were kind of, it was almost like they were cross-dressing or performing those, those identities instead of appearing in this rebellion as themselves. It's a kind of, I don't know, I don't know if it was a way of holding off the responsibility for their actions or rather just using these fictional figures as, as um, again, sort of a shorthand for the kinds of messages they were trying to get across, which is just like, right now the system is unjust and it must change. I have a question. Um, why do you use the term ecology in the title of your talk? Oh, did I? <laughs> <laughs> Let me check. Um, my first book is called The Out Ecology of the English Outlaw. And it's a study of uh, English outlaw narratives as a form of nature writing. And so that particular book reads outlaw material as, you know, it's not just a political um, fiction. It's also one of the first, you know, really uh, detailed depiction of a specific kind of landscape that humans can interact with. 
um, a lot of the outlaw material, not just the Robin Hood material, but the stuff that comes before it is engaged on a really deep level with, you know, specific landscapes like fenlands, you know, like the eels that inhabit the fens and the different kinds of peat that grow there and things like that. Very specific landscapes that you don't often see in medieval literature. So it's possible that I was using a slide from an earlier presentation that just stuck around. <laughs> but if you're interested in that book, it is available. Probably, I know it's available at the university library and could be interlibrary loaned. We could. Yeah. What is it? What's the title of your book, Sarah? That's called The Ecology of the English Outlaw. Okay. Yeah. This the stuff I'm presenting today is, is part of my the second book book project on this material. Great. So any feedback you give me will be very helpful. All right. Yeah, Jordan. Quick, quick question, Sarah. Thanks for this. It's really interesting. Um, you talked at the beginning about how these stories are like reflective of the culture that they're in and seem to have some kind of unique power. And I love that comparison to the Avengers. Um, <laughs> I, I, I don't even really know how to ask this question, but my, I think it's surrounding the idea of to what extent do you see these as reflective of something in the culture or to what extent do you see them as shaping parts of how how people interact in those cultures? Are they reactionary or like constructive or both? Yeah. What do you think? I don't know. <laughs> I, I think it's a really good question. I think, oh, yeah, like, so is this, does the fiction come first and then the, the behavior that's based on the modeled performance in the in the fiction yeah does that come after like if you yeah, see your, yeah, your yeah, role model robin hood do something then you you emulate it or does your behavior create the fiction i said that in a less subtle way than you did um i don't know you know i think the outlaw tradition is so robust in england by the time the robin hood material really starts flowering that um, this is something that's in the water. A, a bunch of other really famous characters are doing this sort of stuff. I think by the time Robin Hood sort of becomes the main outlaw in people's brains, there might be, it seems like his behavior gets a little more specific to what you see people actually doing on the ground in real life. So it's possible that real life is, I mean, it's the old problem with fiction, right? What what comes first, fiction or reality? Right, or right, right, right. Um, it does seem like there's a little more interaction between the two when you get to the Robin Hood material as compared to the more, I don't know if the word is romantic or, or rarefied outlaw material that comes before. That's Anybody? cool. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, I have what I think is a related question. Um, so I'll throw, I'll throw it in there. Um, do you know about what these myths look like in other sort of non-Western cultures? Are there, are they, are they, are the, the stories that have the same kind of cultural power also outlaw stories? Yeah. And if so, are they kind of different? Yeah. Um, well, I, I never want to claim that Great Britain or the British Isles are, have do outlaws better than anyone else. <laughs> right. uh, you know, I think there's some really great, for example, um, there's a cycle of stories in China, you know, the Outlaws of the Marsh, it becomes a novel, I think it was written down by somebody in the 14th century that looks a lot like the Robin Hood material and it has a very similar sort of vibe, but it's more like a novel, like a straight novel. It's very, um, I know that existed in a, a cycle of plays, which is something like the Robin Hood material too, where you have plays and then you have sort of poetic fiction and they seem to exist side by side and be performed in different contexts. So in that way, you know, what's going on in China in the same period is really actually pretty similar, except for in England, of this, you know, sort of really almost lyric narrative poetry. And in China, you have prose that's incredibly dense and, you know, multiple volumes worth of it. Um, uh, yeah, I think, you know, there are precursors to the Robin Hood material in the Celtic tradition as well. I mean, there's some really amazing exile lyrics from, for example, early Irish poetry that are doing really, really beautiful things with the notion of exile. Um, but continental, yeah, I mean, 
fundamentally, the Germanic tradition, the languages that are Germanic tend to have really powerful outlaw stories just because it's part of the legal system in um, you know, proto-Germanic society that just held through till, till now, really. Um, so you know, if you look at Icelandic sagas, for example, there's some incredible outlaw narratives because outlawry is just one of the fundamental ways of controlling you know, or dealing with criminality. And that's true of um, you know, Middle High German, Dutch, English, you know, all the different literatures that are written by, you know, cultures that preserve Germanic law code, which is pretty conservative in nature. So that's cool too. Yeah, very cool. Thanks. Anybody else have any questions? You can speak up or share in chat. Okay. Well, I know it's late for a lot of people. I am always available through email if anyone wants to reach out that way. Uh, and if you have any ideas that would help me think through these questions, I'm always open to feedback and suggestions. So, Sarah, uh, do you mind sharing your email address in the chat box? Yeah, sure. Just in case somebody thinks of something or has an idea to throw out there for you. Yeah. Yeah. There it is. Thanks. OK, well, thanks, everyone, for your time and your attention. And um, I appreciate your coming to the talk. Thank you for spending your evening with us. And uh, yeah, I'm sure some of us will be looking for that first book of yours. Second. Second, second one. Second. Yeah. <laughs> Someday. <laughs> All right, I'm going to stop recording and everybody thank you for showing up and uh, if you want to come to the next talk just remember to email Patty King at rocklandmain.gov and maybe we'll see you next week. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thanks for coming. <laughs> Bye.